This is an apostrophe podcast production. Here's one little question that has no simple answer. How does being alone bring us closer? My name is Peg Fong. I'm a journalist and an educator. Come join me as we explore loneliness together. On the evening of September 25th, 1970, an 11 year old unknown kid named Danny went to sleep in his family's home in Southern California. That night, as he slept, a groovy school bus rolled into view on the television sets of millions of viewers. It traveled down an isolated road at first, but soon the school bus, driven by a nervous mother, followed the signs to Los Angeles and made the turn off to Hollywood Boulevard. After the show premiered September 25th, Danny woke up the next day and opened his blinds to look out his window. There were fans outside and the media. People he didn't know were waiting for him. When they saw him, they started waving and wanted him to wave back. Danny Bonaducci was suddenly, at the age of 11, famous. If there's one word that immediately brings the image of someone to your mind, it may very well be celebrity. Just hearing that word and you associate it with your favorite fill-in-the-blank star. No one listening to us right now may be famous, but we probably all think we know what fame is all about. Many people want fame, even crave it, because of what they believe life is like for the famous. And despite being unfamous, we can all associate the perks of being a celebrity. Fortune, designer clothes, valet parking, mansions with pools. Strangers doing whatever you want just because they want to be around you or win your approval. Endorsements, recognition. But even from the perspective of peering in on the lives of people we think we know, we can see the darker side of fame. The isolation the loneliness. As outsiders, we've witnessed from our safe distance the effects of fame. Brittany, Johnny, Winona, in court, police mugshots, Hugh, Lindsay, Justin. Movie legend Greta Garbo is today most well known for saying during the height of her fame, I want to be alone. Since she said those words almost a hundred years ago in the movie Grand Hotel, Celebrities have often been linked to loneliness. Leonardo DiCaprio gave this answer once. It says something about the human condition that a man who had every dream and aspiration and every opportunity and resource to achieve those dreams and happiness ended up being one of the most lonely and sad human beings. DiCaprio wasn't talking about himself but the real man he portrayed in the movie, The Aviator. Howard Hughes was a billionaire who dated Olivia de Havilland and Katherine Hepburn. He built the fastest seaplane in the world, designed a push-up bra for actor Jane Russell. He was once the richest man in America with mass land holdings in Las Vegas. Hughes produced Hollywood hits, owned a movie studio, RKO Pictures, and an airline, TWA. He secluded himself in hotel suites. Ad man Terry O'Reilly, host of Under the Influence, recalls working in a recording studio in Hollywood next to a building owned by Hughes. In the basement were hundreds of unopened gifts people sent to Hughes that he never bothered to open. He was a noted germaphobe. Howard Hughes was up in the air, allegedly gasping for breath when he died on his way to a Texas hospital from his penthouse in Acapulco, Mexico. A lonely end to a once high-flying life. 
celebrities serve a purpose in the lives of the rest of us, the unknowns. We sometimes glorify their successes, and at times we glorify their failures. They're not just like us. What celebrities prove is that even fame and the adoration of millions who send gifts to the wealthy and the known is no guarantee that we aren't alone. When we peer into the not-so-secret lives of the famous, we think we are gaining insights into their worlds. It's a world that we may recognize. They go grocery shopping like us. They wait in line for coffee like us. It gives us a thrill that they do ordinary things. In an article for Slate, writer Ruth Graham pinpointed the moment when celebrity culture changed. Celebrities used to be citizens from another solar system. But one simple, ordinary act captured by the paparazzi changed that perception. Celebrities were brought back to Earth by a penny being picked up off the street by actor Drew Barrymore. Former Us Weekly reporter Kate Lee described what happened when everything changed. It was an editorial meeting, and the photo editor brought in the potential celebrity shots. The editor of the magazine, Bonnie Fuller, was sifting through photographs taken the night before. There were celebrities at movie premieres, glamorous shots on the red carpets, and famous people dressed for going out on the town. In the 1960s, the proliferation of small light cameras that could fit in your pocket with cartridges that could be easily filled were first introduced by Kodak with the Instamatic camera. That's the end of celebrities, Cary Grant said, referring to the loss of control celebrities had of their image and privacy in a conversation he had with Robert J. Wagner, another film star. Before instant cameras, there were zones where fans, photographers, and celebrities knew the rules, according to R.J. Wagner in his book about the golden age of Hollywood. Now, the famous are baited by photographers and even fans in order to get a reaction. And then the shift to capturing celebrities doing ordinary things. The photo Bonnie Fuller focused on was one of Drew Barrymore leaning over to pick up a coin. Look at Drew Barrymore picking up a penny, she said. It's like stars, they're just like us. The photograph was published on April the 1st, 2002. That's when, Ruth Graham reported, the tabloid media, the paparazzi economy, and the whole celebrity ecosystem changed. Fetching a coin from the street was such an ordinary act that it opened up access to the regularness of the famous. Stars went from being remote aliens in a faraway universe to doing ordinary things, like our neighbors would, like we do, taking kids to school, using pandemic masks as Katy Perry did to pick up dog poop, grocery shopping, paying the parking meter like Reese Witherspoon, and Chris Hemsworth posing for selfies at the KFC drive through of a small Australian town after ordering $73 worth of chicken. When celebrities fall from the sky and are no longer celestial beings, we don't gaze at them as stars from a distance. Cary Grant was always Cary Grant. Photos of him were always posed, deliberate. He was a star, unreachable. Would he have ever bought fried chicken from a drive through The space between us and the famous is measurable, recognizable, and achievable. And in that process, they aren't just like us. We feel closer to them, more connected. In the 21st century, fame has often been cited as a future career. A few years ago, a nationwide survey in the U.S. asked 315 youths aged 9 to 15 years old about their aspirations for the future. The UCLA study found that participants' goals clustered around two factors. There were those youths who fell into the category of individualists, self-focused, 
and others who were in the second category, where they were collectivistic, other-focused aspirations. If you were individualistic, self-focused, your goals were set on becoming famous, achieving a higher social status and increased wealth. The second category were youth who were focused on helping others in need, helping family and living near family. They were more collectivist-minded. The more someone watched television and used social networking sites, the more likely they were to focus on the fame aspirations. In comparison, those who played sports or hung out with friends were more likely to be focused on other people rather than achieving fame. The greatest sense of bonding occurred when youths did face-to-face -face communication. Adolescents who use social media in order to curate their image and search for status through gathering a large number of friends, likes, and comments may be, according to the study, more inclined towards superficial friendships developed through status symbols and image. Why do people want to be famous? In another paper, 15 well-known American celebrities were interviewed by Dr. Donna Rockwell from the Michigan School of Professional Psychology and David C. Giles at the University of Winchester. The interviews detailed the existential parameters of being famous in contemporary culture. The participants were from publishing, sports, music, film, television, news, and business and law. What is the price of fame? Some of the costs aren't surprising. Loss of privacy and entity. Being forced to meet expectations. The self-medication that so many lonely celebrities fall into as a result of isolation. Drinking, drugs, reckless behavior. They crash cars, ballroom brawls, and record sex tapes. Charlie Watts, who died in August and was the Rolling Stones drummer, used to go back to his hotel room every night while the Stones were on tour. When his bandmates were downstairs in the bar drinking, he was up alone in his room, and every night he would make a sketch of his surroundings. Being lonely and isolated by fame led many celebrities to do things that drew even more attention to themselves. But fame is not all bad. There is also gratification in being famous, it meets certain needs of the ego and even a sense of immortality. The psychological demands for celebrities are mistrust and isolation, loss of friends who will sell stories about you. In his song, New Biography, Van Morrison sings about the so-called friends who claim to have known him who played the name game, fame game. How could they have such good memories, Van Morrison writes, when he can't even remember last week? There was also an unwillingness, despite that toll, according to the research, to give up being famous. Being in the world a celebrity, as Dr. Rockwell says, is a process. There are four temporal phases, love, hate, addiction, acceptance, and then adaptation. She quotes movie producer John Waters in her paper. Most everybody secretly imagines themselves in show business, and every day on their way to work, they're a little bit depressed because they're not. People are sad they're not famous in America. Those who do become famous aren't always willing to be recruited to talk about it in academic research. Donna Rockwell's paper was one of the first to conduct in-depth interviews with celebrities for empirical purposes. She had unique access to the famous. As one of the first people to work for CNN when it was a startup network, Rockwell witnessed people go from behind the scenes to suddenly being on air and becoming recognizable anchors, famous. And she was also on hand to see unknowns become knowns, then stars. People do not know what's in store for them. I associate becoming famous with being in a car crash in the context of what kind of an impact it has on people's lives. Rockwell later left journalism to become a clinical psychologist, and now she works as a fame coach, teaching those who are on the verge of fame or who are experiencing it at the present 
how to deal with the loneliness and the attention. She also counsels celebrities who are no longer famous, but the loneliness remains, even when the attention from a demanding public is gone. You know, it's interesting to me as a clinical psychologist now just to see how we go into life not understanding how our mental apparatus and our physical bodies interact with one another. So here we have this incredible novel experience of like a billion eyeballs on us, right? When we've before that point simply been going about our business, going food shopping, going to school, having a career, creating a family, and we don't really think about what happens when everything changes externally for us. Those changes have a toll emotionally and mentally. But also there is a physiological change. For the famous, something inside them internally shifts. Neurologically, our central nervous system becomes acclimated to all of those eyeballs, right? Well, first of all, it shocks us because it's overwhelming. It's like an impact. We're on the side of the road and we're like, what the heck happened? All of a sudden, people who we don't even know are kissing up to us. People that we do really know are abandoning us. Even people you don't think will ever change do. Ringo Starr noted that when the Beatles returned to Liverpool after their appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, his family members began treating him like a celebrity, which alarmed him. When Dr. Rockwell coaches people on how to deal with being famous, she prepares them for what happens when neurons become used to those kinds of stimulations of being looked at, stared at. Some people, like actors Alec Baldwin and Sean Penn, have a notorious reputation in response to that kind of intrusion. Penn served a month behind bars in 1987 for an assault against a photographer and shot at a helicopter circling overhead during his wedding to Madonna. When I was a reporter at the Vancouver Sun, I was once asked to confront Princess Caroline of Monaco as she got off a plane at YVR to ask her about her love interest. The newsroom was tipped off by the paparazzi in London that she was on the flight, and the instruction was to assign a young, aggressive female reporter to ask questions about her affair. What the photographers wanted was for their target to react to my questions, and that was their money shot. They say it's lonely at the top, right? There's all these expressions. They didn't come out of nowhere. It is lonely at the top because you're there by yourself and people start treating you differently. There's something very fascinating to me called reflected glory. And it's how people love to be within the spotlight of someone else's fame so they can have the reflected glory of that fame. You can be the famous person's best friend or their husband or their wife or their child or their friend from high school. I mean, if you went to high school with someone who became famous or elementary school for that matter, or nursery school for that matter, we would be bragging about it. Do you know that I went to nursery school with Brooke Shields? I didn't, but that's the kind of thing I'd be saying. So that's reflected glory. In her book, Fame, where she analyzed being a celebrity, Justine Bateman, the actor and director, wrote about being in an elevator once with two other people. They know each other. They don't know her. They began talking about her, commenting that her hair is darker on TV. And then when she said out loud, I can hear you, they were shocked and angry with her. Bateman believes it was because she had shattered the fourth wall, reached across the membrane between her plane of existence, which was a not-a-real-person status, to theirs, two real people, having a private conversation about someone that was to them a public figure, who they could discuss, dissect, and judge. Discuss, dissect, even judge, but don't leave. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to Alone Together. There's another podcast on the Apostrophe Podcast Network that I know you're going to enjoy. 
It's called Under the Influence, and it's hosted by Terry O'Reilly. It's a fascinating show about how the advertising industry influences our lives. Terry is an insider. He was an ad man for 35 years, and he tells behind-the-scenes stories about famous advertising campaigns. It's a fun and funny show that intersects pop culture and advertising and gives you, the listener, a backstage pass to the closed world of advertising. If you never thought you would ever listen to a show about marketing, try this one. It was downloaded 7 million times last year and over 4,700 reviews. There's a full archive to binge on and available wherever you get your podcasts. Under the Influence, hosted by Terry O'Reilly. In the late 1990s, Bateman wrote there was no frenzy to be famous. Sure, there were celebrities who were very famous, but at the height of her stardom, she noted that fame wasn't coveted by everyone. People were amazed when they saw the famous, but they didn't then immediately afterwards start thinking about how they then could attain fame. Her hypothesis was people took pride in whatever they were good at, whether it was as a dentist or a publicist or a stationary store owner. There's almost a shame these days that people haven't made their mark and become famous. Mostly this shift is attributed to social media. We judge ourselves based on how many views or likes or followers we have. And social media attention increased the odds of finding fame as did the popularity of reality shows starting in the early 2000s. Being viral, being shared, can make you famous. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be famous. But perhaps the loneliness for us comes in when we're on the other side of the screen, when we wonder, why am I not well-known? Why am I not famous? Seeking fame is one thing. When it doesn't happen, it can leave those on the other side of that screen questioning what we have done or haven't done to be alone and on our own, without fans wanting to track our every move, even picking up a penny from the ground. In Look At Me, a book by Dr. Orville Gilbert Brim, who studied child and human development, intelligence, ambition, and personality, he cited that the pursuit of fame has been consistent for more than 40 years. National surveys show that 2% of respondents say fame is their number one desire. So roughly calculating, that is 4 million adults in the U.S. who say fame is their primary motive, or about two out of every 100 people are driven by this desire. The rest of the population, 98%, are meh, okay with not being famous. When you look at the odds which Orville Brim calculated using halls of fame and biographies around the world, there are perhaps only 30,000 entries of people who merit being noted for their fame. And of that, 10,000 of these people are dead. So this leaves about 20,000 slots for 4 million fame seekers and 3.98 million people with their primary drive being unfulfilled. Those are pretty lonely odds for fame seekers. There's a distinction between fame and celebrity, according to a number of sources. Fame has been around longer and happens when typically a mass urban society glorifies individuals for their deeds. Think Alexander the Great. Celebrity is more a modern phenomenon related to mass media, first by newspapers, magazines, radio, television, and the internet. One definition of being a celebrity is they are known for their well-knownness. That is an apt description for Lord Byron, the poet who may be the first modern celebrity. Well, modern as in he died in 1824 at the age of 36, to have garnered so much attention due to media and gossip. 
He was famous for one third of his life, starting at age 24, when his confessional poems were first published in 1812. Everything about him afterwards was tracked from his diet, where the public caught him eating mutton and potatoes when he had maintained he only ate soda water and hard biscuits, to female acquaintances believing that Byron's poems were about them. So potent was his fame that in a prelude to modern-day celebrity photographers, he was followed around by tourists who stayed in hotels to be near him, and then when he went to other more remote locations, his fans paid to use spy glasses to see if they could get a glimpse of him. Women climbed through Lord Byron's window to pursue him. When John Lennon was separated from Yoko Ono in the early 70s, he started dating May Pang. In her book, Pang wrote that John got drunk one night and began screaming, no one cares about me, nobody loves me. They went to a big party one night in New York full of other rock and roll celebrities. Almost no one came up to John Lennon to talk to him. He decided to leave early and was clearly in a sad mood as they made their way home. May asked him what was wrong and Lennon said it was clear the other rockers didn't like him as nobody came up to chat. May Pang stopped in her tracks, grabbed John Lennon by his cheeks and said, don't you get it? They are in total awe of you. They are afraid to talk to you. There are celebrities, then there are Beatles. If mere celebrities are lonely, imagine what a Beatle must feel like. At the height of his fame, David Cassidy, who played Keith Partridge, the oldest brother, had more fans in his fan club than Elvis and Beatles combined. Like Byron, David Cassidy had women go through incredible lengths to be touched by his fame and to touch him, including servicing his most base desires through a chain-link fence meant to keep the teen idol separated from his fans. When Ann Moses was the editor for Tiger Beat, a magazine that was aimed at giving adoring young girls access to their favorite teen idols in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, she saw fame up close. She loved Elvis, Bobby Sherman, and the Beatles in her teen years growing up in Anaheim, California. She had access to celebrities she met while working at Disneyland on weekends and in the summer. When Anne started working for Tiger Beat in the summer of 1967, she was one of the first people to interview the Bee Gees as they were on the first step of their ladder up to superstardom. And of course, none of us knew that they would become such superstars. So it was kind of unfiltered and they could be so open and joke around and we had so much fun. At 21, she had already done many profiles of people on their way to becoming celebrities when she interviewed David Cassidy. He was 19 at the time, and she knew enough about how actors became stars and then teen idols that she knew he was going to become huge. I could see that every teenage girl in America <laughs> was going to think he was dropped gorgeous. So at first he was very unguarded and very much you get to know what the actual person is like before they come a star. And with David, you know, we sat down early on because we realized he was going to be a teen idol. One of the things she learned quickly at Tiger Beat was to recognize who was going to become famous. And she also quickly figured out there were unguarded moments that only happened at the beginning of stardom. It was a certain time before the loneliness set in and they cut off sharing information. They're loved by millions and millions of people around the world, but they don't have one other person in most cases at that point in time in their life. They don't have another person that they know that they can tell their secrets to, they can share their frustrations. They don't get that out. And I think it just builds and builds and builds. And they decide to lose themselves in pot or booze. I think it's too much for one person 
to deal with. Because she saw his rise from being open to being completely isolated from everyone around him, Anne believes that David Cassidy was the loneliest person she ever interviewed. Most people in show business, they have this this dream that is crystal clear in their minds. But that contributes to the loneliness because they're not going to go around saying, well, I'm going to be a superstar. and They're not going to talk about it. But inside, that is what they're craving. That is what they're working for. And I think that the downfall is that they don't know what the concrete result of becoming famous is. Because it, it's not all it's cracked up to be. During the three-year run of the Partridge family, Danny Bonaducci and especially David Cassidy were besieged by thousands and even hundreds of thousands of fans whenever they appeared in public. Each time Danny Bonaducci arrived at the Burbank Studios where the show was filmed, he and his mom had to wade through a sea of women to get to his dressing room. One morning in 1974, he and his mother pulled into the Burbank studio lot. But unlike every other day, that day, the guard did not smile, wave, and open the gate for them. That morning, he stopped their car, asked them what they were doing there, and before they could answer, the guard told them, go home, the Partridge family doesn't live here anymore. At 14 years old, Danny Bonaducci was canceled. Guards, gates, chain link fences, they're meant to keep fans from reaching the famous, but they also remain as a barrier after the fame has passed. Former Tiger Beats editor Ann Moses says for the rest of their lives, many celebrities who had been touched by mass love feel there is not one person who loves them for who they are. Their isolation from others leads them to only trust a few. Elvis had his Memphis Mafia, cousins and boyhood friends he grew up with. In his book, Danny Bonaducci says it was David Cassidy who looked out for him when he was younger and then brought him on tour with him when he was trying to make it as a stand-up comedian years after the Partridge family ended its run. David Cassidy himself said being a teen idol came with it, an intense loneliness, and that isolation was as much a burden as the fame. What he really wanted to do, he said once, was to walk up to people and say, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. But he could never do that because people's perception of him was set and there was no possibility of having a conversation. That's lonely. The person who is about to be famous goes through stages. At first, they like the attention. Then they find that spotlight invasive and finally they realize there's no escape, says fame coach Donna Rockwell. For the rest of us, there is reflected glory. We want to be associated with celebrities, the famous. We want to believe they are like us. And perhaps we feel less alone when we know they are also lonely. We all want to matter. We want it when we're little kids. We want to matter to our parents and we want to matter to our friends and our teachers and to the person we love who may not love us back. We seek connections. In our aloneness, we want to be known, whether we are seeking fame or watching it from a distance. It is the pursuit of relevance. For some, it's being relevant to millions of strangers. For others, it's being relevant to one other. In both cases, it's about not wanting to be alone. What celebrities prove to us is that fame is no guarantee that we aren't alone. Later in her life, Greta Garbo made clear what she really said. I never said I want to be alone. I said I only want to be left alone. There is all the difference. Even in their firmament, the shiniest and brightest are lonely. And that loneliness brings them down to earth. 
where the rest of us are waiting to catch a falling star. We may be alone, but we are alone together. Alone Together was directed by Callie O'Reilly. Theme music by Ari Posner and Ian Lefevre. Sound engineer, Jeff Devine. Producer, Debbie O'Reilly, Allison Pinches, and Guillermo Serrano. I'm Peg Fong, the host and writer. It's great to be back for season two. I would rate our short break as a five out of five. Please subscribe and tell someone about our show. And follow us on social at apostrophe pod. You can always find our show notes and links to our interviews, guests, and our research at apostrophepodcast.ca backslash alone together. This series is executive produced by Terry O'Reilly. See you next week. ACAS recommends black creators who are making an impact this month and beyond. Welcome to Two Black Girls, One Rose. Where two black ass girls evade the whitest show on earth. The The Bachelor. Bachelor. I'm Natasha. And I'm Justine. And every week we recap this dumpster fire of an American pastime. We call out the problematic mess of the Bachelor franchise, interview special guests like Rachel Lindsay and Mike Johnson, crown a Becky of the Week, and invite someone to our cookout. In addition to the Bachelor franchise, we also recap Married at First Sight, Love is Blind, and other reality TV mess. Listen to the first 20 minutes of every episode on Acast, and for exclusive access to our full episodes, join us on Patreon at patreon.com backslash the number two black girls, the number one rose. Acast 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 recommends. recommends.